is Dr. Smith Hicks, in case anyone on here doesn't know, is one of our distinguished speakers at this year's all virtual global neuroscience conference. And um, I think it's pretty special that Dr. Roger, Bing or Roger Bingham, who's our moderator, actually found you, Dr. Smith Hicks, and was the catalyst for me to reach out to you. And then I really was um, so wonderful to meet in person, especially after being in this pandemic for so long. And then to actually tour the Kennedy Krieger Center where you're at, um, to me was truly remarkable. And we always do some photos. I, you can go back to the first one. This is our first Zoom call. And that was back in June. And I definitely felt a heart connection to you on that Zoom call. And um, was just really excited to have you involved in the conference. I could tell how much you love the work that you do and the, and the way you love the families that you serve. And it just felt so familiar, like we were gonna just bring you on um, and be part of the autism tree family out here. So then these next set of pictures are my recent visit in August. And this is Dr. Smith Hicks in her department, which is a very large department. Um, and I can't wait for you to hear more from her about all the incredible work she does as the director of this um, center. And Kennedy Krieger Institute um, is 85 years old and has 85 departments. And I just thought that was so interesting because Autism Tree is 18 years old and we have 20 programs and I feel that they've migrated very organically and we're not a clinical setting, but what we're doing is we are providing social communication opportunities. I'm sure you won't be surprised, Dr. Smith, that almost every um, parent that calls, that's what they're asking for at, to us at Autism Tree. They're asking for many things, but one thread that they're all asking for is more social communication opportunities. And so I think um, I felt really blessed learning that Kennedy Krieger is 85 years old and has 85 departments. I thought, well, you know, we're you know 18 years old and we have 20 programs. And I, I felt inspired by that, that I think we're where we need to be. And I think today I'd like to think that something special is happening. Um, I really felt that when I went out to the Kennedy Krieger Institute and then we have Jeff here on the call and Jeff has been um, one of our biggest um, leaders and contributors to these lunch and learns. And I like to see this, the relationship um, keep growing between the East Coast and the West Coast and having you involved in the conference, I don't see as a, a, a transactional thing. I see as like, we're coming together and um, it's just very exciting that Dr. Doris Troner, who helped us start our foundation, and um, Caitlin is on the call from her office today. Thank you for being here, Caitlin. Dr. Troner helped us start Autism Tree Project, and she introduced me to the CEO of Kennedy Krieger Institute, and that's who set up the tour for me. And it's just, it's so exciting to me, Dr. Smith Hicks, that Dr. Doris Troner out here and Bradley, um, I don't want to mispronounce his name. Will you say his full name for me? Schlager. Can you Schlager. hear me? Bradley Schlager. Uh -huh. Yeah, Bradley Schlager. Um, I just think it's wonderful that they're both colleagues. And I was on our pre-call today, I was telling Dr. Smith Hicks what an incredibly exciting um, Zoom call we had with our chairman for the neuroscience conference, Dr. Allison Motri and our moderator, Roger Bingham with Bradley. and. Now Bradley is going to be introducing um, Dr. Smith Hicks at the conference and also doing an overview of the whole Kennedy Krieger Institute. So I'm just really thrilled for you all today to realize that this is a starting point of something I see um, building in the future, Dr. Smith Hicks, and I hope you feel the same way. And I want to give you a warm, warm welcome and say I already feel like you're part of our autism tree family. Thank you, Dana. I do feel the warmth. Uh, coming from you and from the rest of the folks on the Zoom call. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to be able to uh, talk with you about one of the things that's really near and dear to me, which is uh, trying to understand and in so doing help support uh, individuals and their families of children with uh, autism and other forms of um, neurodiversity and neurodifferences. So 
I'm, uh, in addition to being the medical director of the Center for Autism, I'm a neurologist and my uh, special interest is in uh, neurogenetics. And uh, for that reason, I'm really gonna focus on, on talking about the genetics of autism uh, today. You know, my goals today are to start by giving an overview of genetics, a higher level overview, talk a little about the history of genetics in autism, genetic cl clinical genetic testing, and then I'll end with uh, some patient cases and um, some resources, okay? So when we think about our bodies, we have um, it's estimated anywhere between 30 to 700 trillion cells. And the vast majority of those cells have a nucleus in which our genetic information or our genome is compacted in the form of chromosomes, right? We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, men have an X and a Y, and women have two X, and then there are uh, 22 other pairs of what we call autosomes. If you were to drill down into the chromosomes, you would notice that they're comprised of genes. And if further drilling down into the genes, they are um, comprised of DNA sequence, which is made up of these nucleotides called A, C, G, and T. Okay, so the our genetic material is housed in the DNA, and our DNA effectively encodes for um, the information that determines what we look like and what we do. So both our features and our function. The genetic information in the DNA gets converted to a type of RNA called the messenger RNA. So that RNA holds the message from the DNA and then it gets converted to proteins, which actually does the work. So, when we think about uh, genetic testing, if we are doing genetic testing um, from a bench research perspective, uh, we are trying to understand what genes are associated with uh, what abnormality in cell function or animal function. And so individuals who do bench research, they may effectively knock out a gene. So they disrupt the function of the gene and they look to see how does it impact the animal. So whether the animal is a, is a worm, a fly, or a mouse. When we work with uh, humans and we're doing genetic testing or human genome type research, uh, we're looking at um, large population levels and we're asking what genes are associated with what disorders. And when we do genetic testing clinically, we're sort of asking the same things. We're looking in the individual's genetic information and we are asking, can we identify changes that are rare and are powerful? So those changes in the genetic information, whether it's the chromosome level or the DNA level, do they result in abnormal protein or do they result in no protein at all? All of us have genetic changes, but those genetic changes don't necessarily cause a problem in our functioning. The, the genetic changes that do not disrupt function of the gene are those that are generally common changes across the population, and they determine our unique features, right? And so on, on this side of the slide, I talk about quote unquote, normal gene and normal protein, right? Now with, with all of that information that we have been able to ascertain over years, in the last 40 years or so, there's been a tremendous growth in our knowledge uh, about the, the role of genetics in autism. And it started about in the mid seventies when uh, we saw that there was a high genetic uh, contribution uh, to autism in a uh, twin study. So uh, identical twins, monozygotic twins that is, uh, there was a higher concordance with the diagnosis of autism in those individuals as compared to fraternal twins. And as technology improved over time, we were able to look at the chromosomes, the entire 
chromosomal size and, and, and the number. And there are some situations when an individual might have had three copies of a chromosomes if a common uh, condition is Down syndrome. And some of those individuals would have autism spectrum disorder. As time went on, we were able to look more closely at the chromosome and we would um, use a, a technology called a microarray. And we were able to ask, are there pieces of the chromosome that are missing or are there more than they should be? And in the last, uh, probably in the 1990s to current, the, uh, of our ability to sequence our genome or sequence the, gen the genetic information has really um, increased significantly. And so that um, increase in our knowledge and our technology, in addition to a reduction in the cost for genetic uh, testing and sequencing, has resulted in a tremendous increase in the number of genes that have been associated with an autism. Here I have a very busy slide and the goal is not to overwhelm you, but to give you a sense of the number of sheer number of genes uh, that are associated with autism and are considered to be autism risk genes. Um, they are uh, present on all of the chromosomes, so one through 22 and both of the X and the Y. These autism risk genes, they have their function in the neurons um, and they uh, have their function either in the nucleus where they're regulating the expression of other genes, or they may function at the synapses, so where the neurons talk together. These risk genes, generally the many of them function during this critical period of brain development, so during pregnancy, and early in childhood. And some continue to have their function throughout the lifespan, so adolescence and adulthood. So how do we transition from uh, this population-based or bench research-based uh, understanding of uh, genetics and autism to patients, individual, individuals? Well, we generally use clinical genetic testing. And we think of genetic testing or clinical testing as a tool to identify the cause for the disorder, um, not to diagnose, in this case, not to diagnose autism. Um, similarly, genetic testing cannot be used to diagnose epilepsy or intellectual disability. Again, we're looking for rare, powerful genetic changes. And when I say powerful, I mean that a single change in the genetic information can disrupt the protein. In an earlier slide, I shared that um, our, our knowledge of genetics has increased over time and or our technology has increased over time. So you can imagine if someone had testing done in the early 2000s, if they did not find uh, an explanation for why the individual had autism, if they were to do testing now, it's very likely that they might indeed find an explanation. So I alluded to chromosome microarray uh, earlier. And that's uh, a technology that allows us to ask, are all the genes present in the right number? So are they deleted where a, a section of the chromosome, so a section of the, the number of genes are missing? Are they duplicated in which case you have um, more genes or in this case, twice the number of genes um, that uh, one would expect? This is considered one of the first tier of testing uh, for individuals with autism or other uh, neurodevelopmental challenges. Fragile X DNA sequencing is another example of a first tier testing. And in this particular test, we're looking at uh, the repeat size, so the CGG repeat size in a gene called fMR1. Now, all of us have some number of repeats. And six to 44 repeats are considered common and are present uh, in uh, neurotypical individuals, whereas individuals with uh, fragile X syndrome 
uh, have greater than uh, 200 CGG repeats. And these repeats are what we call methylated. So the body's attempt to stop the repeat expansion, um, it does that by methylating it. And in so doing, um, can you still see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. And in so doing, it uh, turns off um, the uh, expression of that gene. So we have no FMR, FMR1 protein. Um, in some individuals, they have uh, anywhere between 55 to 200 repeats. Those individuals are in the pre-mutation range. And there's been some literature to suggest that some individuals in the pre-mutation range can have some level of uh, developmental challenges, ADHD, maybe a little bit of learning challenges. And as they get older, uh, women are at risk for early menopause. And um, some are at risk for what we call fragile extremary ataxia. Uh, it's uh, similar to our Parkinson's uh, disease. So it has features of Parkinson's disease. Um, but the fragile extremity ataxia is more commonly seen in men when compared to women. And the intermediate um, zone, uh, we, we, we call that the gray zone because we don't yet have a good understanding of um, what occurs as a consequence uh, of the immediate intermediate size repeats. Now, DNA sequencing, we clinically uh, can perform what we call panel testing. So um, a panel may include anywhere between 50 to 2,000 genes. By the way, we have over 20,000 genes uh, in our bodies. Um, and so the panel a DNA test will test anywhere between 50 to 200, whereas the whole exome sequencing is looking at all 20,000 plus uh, genes. But it's looking at just the part of the gene that codes for the protein and not the part of the gene that regulates um, the, the protein expression. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the things that we can see uh, on genetic testing, right? So when you see a, the report from a clinical genetic test, you'll see the term variance. Any genetic change is considered a variant. So variant is a, is a neutral term, right? Um, we can see, uh, as I said earlier, all of us have variants because all of us have genetic changes. Those changes um, that are benign and don't uh, cause a problem are generally common and they contribute to um, our uniqueness. Um, there are other changes that we use the term pathogenic to describe, and those are the changes that actually disrupt the function of the gene. The changes may occur at the level of the chromosome. So um, in the case of Down syndrome, you have a whole <coughs> extra chromosome. Um, the changes may occur within the chromosome, as I showed you before on the slide with a microarray. You may be missing uh, a region of the chromosome, so missing a number of genes, or you may have duplication of those genes. You can also have structural rearrangements of the chromosome. So a part of chromosome 13 is, is missing and it's attached to chromosome 15. We, when we do sequencing uh, of DNA, we can identify uh, variants in single genes. So that could be an alteration in the sequence. So instead of having a T, you have an A. We can also see duplications or deletions in a single gene where it's duplication or deletion of a, uh, a, a small section of, of the gene. Whenever an individual um, has, uh, if we have identified um, a genetic change, which is um, classified as pathogenic or likely pathogenic, one of the questions um, we as uh, neurogeneticists and geneticists or genetic counselors ask is, was it inherited? And I wanna emphasize genetics is not the blame game, but because an understanding of the inheritance pattern 
informs uh, not only um, uh, understanding of the risk for recurrence, it also informs our understanding of the clinical features, but it also allows us to support the family either in additional care that can be provided or organizations that that family can then become a part of. What we and others have noted is that the vast majority of individuals with an autism spectrum disorder who uh, have an identified genetic change, that change is new in the child. So that's what we call de novo, meaning it's not inherited. Inheritance can be um, occur uh, using a, a, a mechanism called autos uh, autosomal recessive. Now, earlier I said that we each have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we, here you have um, a pair of chromosome. Um, and uh, in the case of an autosomal recessive disorder, the child needs to have a, a pathogenic variant on both copies of the gene one that they inherited from the mom and one that they might have inherited from the dad. Parents here are not affected because they only have one copy that's not working, but the child is affected because the child has both copies that are not working. And then there is the autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance where the child would inherit the variant gene from one parent, in this case, the mother. So both mother and child are affected. So whether it's autism or any other um, uh, developmental uh, challenge, uh, epilepsy or learning problems or otherwise. And then finally here I have X-linked, right? So X-linked implies that the, gen the gene is on the X chromosome. And in this particular case, um, since mother has a two X's, one will go to either her son or her daughter. And uh, in this particular case, uh, when the, the male child inherits the pathogenic variant, that child is affected. And when the female child inherits the pathogenic variant, that child can either be affected or it can be a carrier. So X-linked disorders become a little bit more complicated in their expression as compared to the other disorders. So I'm gonna segue and I'm gonna talk about um, two patients um, whom I have cared for over the years and uh, just kind of tell you a little bit about um, their history and their, um, the results of testing for them. So first we have this seven-year-old boy um, who was diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Uh, he also had some learning disabilities. His parents and their siblings were uh, young and they wanted to have more kids. Uh, this child was the only one in the family who had a, a diagnosis of autism and learning challenges. Um, but we also learned from the family that the child's mother's uh, aunt and the child's uh, mother's father um, were, uh, had, had some medical issues. The mother, the uh, aunt had uh, menopause and the father was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So we, we opted to do the, um, the first year testing. So chromosomal microarray and then the fragile X DNA testing. And in this little boy, we determined that he had the full mutation so he was given a diagnosis of Fragile X syndrome. Fragile X syndrome, by the way, is the most common single gene inherited cause of autism or intellectual challenges. Primarily affects boys, but can also affect girls. So his mom had a repeat size in the pre-mutation uh, range. Cannot seem to find my mouse. Here it is. So um, mother had a um, repeat size in the pre-mutation range. And so we were able to talk about her risk for going into early menopause and some of the things that she may be able to do um, in light of that knowledge, uh, given her interest in having other children. We also talked about her small risk for having the tremor ataxia, ataxia syndrome. 
we were able to connect with um, um, the maternal aunt and the maternal grandfather. And uh, we were able to perform uh, fragile X testing on both. And they too had um, a repeat in the premutation range, which would explain the Parkinson's like features in the grandfather and the early menopause um, in the maternal aunt. Now, in this particular family, we identified the genetic cause for one individual, but it had a ripple effect across multiple generations. Um, it was able, we were able to inform the care, uh, not only of the immediate child, because we were able to connect to the family uh, with um, the Fragile X Foundation, but um, we were able to do some anticipatory guidance as to what are the things medical and otherwise to be on the lookout for. Um, we were able to support um, not only the, the mother and her siblings, but also um, the grandfather and uh, his sister um, in connecting them with other resources, uh, both medical and otherwise. So, you know, fragile X testing, um, although it accounts for a small number of individuals with autism spectrum disorder, it can have a tremendous impact in the, in the larger family. You may recall, I, we also did chromosomal microarray on, on that child, and we uh, identified a change on the short arm of chromosome 11 that was pathogenic. It was a deletion, which we did not expect. So it was a deletion of um, a piece of the small arm of chromosome 11. And within that deleted region was the KCNQ1 gene. That gene is associated with a disorder called long QT, which is a heart arrhythmia. And so we were able then to um, connect uh, this child and his family with um, a cardiologist who could monitor him and intervene as was necessary. I must say that not all cases, not all individuals that we uh, evaluate, uh, we perform genetic testing on do we necessarily find a cause, but we do find it in a subset of individuals. Now the next patient that I wanna talk about is um, eight month old boy that I saw. Um, and, and no, this boy was not given a diagnosis of autism at eight months old, um, but uh, his clinical presentation was that of profound hypotonia. Eight months, he was not rolling, not sitting, um, not really using his hands. Um, and he also had some abnormal eye movement. So I opted to do an MRI of the brain. I noticed that there was some abnormalities that suggest that he may have a condition called Javert syndrome. Um, because there are so many genes that are associated with Javert, we opted instead of doing a panel to do whole exome sequencing. Uh, um, uh, and in, in so doing, we were able to include um, his parents and his older brother who was diagnosed with autism and profound ID and that brother had not yet had genetic uh, testing. So, with um, this family, um, what we identified was that the, both the, the child um, and the brother had the same pathogenic variants. In this particular case, it was inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion where both, uh, the ch both children had a pathogenic variant in both copies of the gene, say gene A, for example. And mother had one um, variant in uh, one of her, one copy of her gene, and the dad had a different variant in uh, a copy of his gene. Mother and dad, they're not affected, they're typically developed, have no problems. Uh, both both uh, children uh, were affected with um, the younger of the two having a global developmental delay. Um, he is otherwise thriving and connected to services and the older of the two having um, autism and profound intellectual disability. So we certainly were able to connect to the family with um, the Jaber support group. 
we're able to provide anticipatory guidance. Um, but this is an example of two individuals in a family having the same genetic change, but yet having a different clinical presentation. And that, that goes to show how variable um, genetic um, uh, presentations can be even within uh, the same family. So in summary, um, we all have genetic variants. Not all variants disrupt protein function, but clinical genetic tests, we're looking for those rare variants that disrupt the function of the protein. Um, I discussed three different types of testing, fMR1 DNA testing, microarray, and whole exome. And they're all looking for different types of variants. So at this point in time, we don't yet have a single genetic test that is used clinically, and I emphasize used clinically, that can find all variant types. There is, um, some of you may know that there is whole genome sequencing that's being done more at a research level, hasn't quite taken hold of in the clinics. But with whole genome testing, there are uh, several of these variant types that we are able to capture. Um, as I showed in, um, uh, genetic variants are not always inherited. Um, and autism risk genes, they do impact the brain generally very early in development. Um, someone had asked, I don't remember uh, who it was, but um, one of the individuals who said um, she wrote maybe to the question of would you perform genetic testing? Um, she said uh, that her physician said, well, it cannot help and insurance might be a challenge. Um, so while genetic testing at this point in time does not allow us, it's very rare that we can um, go in and make changes to the gene, except in perhaps disorders that are not brain-based. Um, genetic testing results can certainly inform the care we provide. So for example, if the gene uh, is a channelopathy, we may be able to selectively um, uh, target the medications that we use. Uh, genetic testing results may inform recurrence risk. It may help us identify uh, disorders that the individual is at, is at risk for that we did not suspect. And so we can provide anticipatory guidance. And it also allows us to provide support for the patient and the family. You know, one of the things parents often say is, um, you know, I've been blaming myself for the longest because I thought I did something wrong in my pregnancy. Even though I tried my best, I did everything by the book, right? And then I've had parents who really break down in tears um, and it's tears of relief knowing that they had no control over the genetics of their child. Um, some parents have also said that it's been so reassuring to be able to connect with other people who understand where I am and what the experiences have been and are ahead of me in their journey and can share and in so doing provide anticipatory guidance. One of the other benefits, and this is the research arm, um, that genetic testing certainly informs our research. Um, there is a, a gene called SYNGAP1, um, which is one of the areas of my um, specialization. The gene was uh, identified to play a role in brain function, aporeceptor function, uh, back in 1998 or so it was published. But it was not until 2012 when it was first linked with a clinical diagnosis um, or a clinical disorder. And that's because we're able to make that link uh, because of clinical genetic testing. So from my vantage point, I do see a lot of benefits of uh, clinical genetic testing. To the question about insurance um, and insurance coverage, um, we here at the Kennedy Krieger Institutes um, have had um, um, the good fortune of collaborating with uh, various labs um, that has 
facilitated our ability to get genetic testing for the vast majority of our patients. But um, that certainly has been a challenge, but I think genetic testing costs have declined over time and insurance providers are being informed of the value of uh, genetic testing. So with that, I will share a bunch of resources um, here. Um, there are resources, so an individual who has a known uh, genetic diagnosis, they can uh, visit these various sites um, that um, they'll be able to find information uh, about their specific disorder. Um, sometimes Facebook groups, private Facebook groups have been uh, um, uh, useful in that regard. And there are gene-specific or disorder-specific foundations. Clinicaltrials.gov is a good resource um, for looking for not, not only intervention trials, but also a clinical research that's trying to better understand uh, the spectrum of the genetic disorder. So thank you all for listening. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you again. Bye.